This is WXOJLP Northampton, 103.3 FM, your Valley Free Radio Station. Welcome. I'm Warren Odeschulet, and this is A Baha'i Perspective. A Baha'i Perspective is a radio program that presents a Baha'i perspective on life through interviews. If you want information specifically on the Baha'i faith, you're welcome to visit the website www.baha'i.org, that's B-A-H-A-I dot O-R-G, or you can call the toll-free number 1-800-22-UNITE. Today I'm playing an interview with Darlene Key, a Baha'i who grew up in the south side of Chicago. She moved to Hartford, Connecticut when she started working at Traveler's Insurance Company. She soon got married and became a stay-at-home mom in New London, Connecticut, where she became a neighborhood activist. She got involved with the Multicultural Coalition of Southeast Connecticut and the Institute for the Healing of Racism. Now she's a social worker for the state of Connecticut. I started the interview by asking Darlene to describe where she grew up. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois, and um, I came from a very close-knit family and extended family. I grew up in an all-black neighborhood and community where it was a lot of black pride. Mm. It was, education was um, highly stressed. At family events or birthday parties, it wasn't so much friends. It was just the family. That's how many it was of us. Extended family. It was very large. And a lot of things that I do now came from that background. Mm. Education was deeply stressed in black history. I'll give a quick example of a Christmas. Okay. And Christmas was with on my father's side. And we'll start off with brunch at one relative's house. And then at evening, we'll have dinner at another aunt's house. It was a great aunt. And she had this house that was made of glass windows and a spiral staircase. Oh, my gosh. And I used to play under that. And the adults, especially the men, used to sit in front of the staircase until one year she found out why and she moved them. Jeez. Okay? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, that was our Aunt Sadie. Uh-huh. And um, uh-huh. she was very active in city politics. Oh, really? And she was founded a group home for the Wayward Girls. Oh, wow. Um, she lived to be in her 90s. Mm-hmm. And I then found out that the daughter of a husband of hers was a Baha'i. Oh, really? So there was a Baha'i in your family before you even knew about the Baha'i Before I knew it. And then she filled me in, the same Aunt Sadie, with Mm -hmm. my Aunt Mary's. And her best friend was the person who wrote The Lights of Guidance, Helen Hornby. Okay, one more time. Okay. Helen Hornby was my Aunt Mary's best friend. They found out about the faith at the same time. Uh, Helen Hornby um, remained a family friend. She became a Baha'i, but my Aunt Mary did not. Mm-hmm. So there was Helen Hornby remained close friends to my family all in, through her 70s. And Helen Hornby wrote a book, she, Lights of Guidance? The Lights of Guidance. I see, which is a Baha'i book. So you had an extended family experience. Yes. I had five brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Each of my parents had uh, seven siblings apiece. And I had grandparents and my aunts and uncles were teenagers when we were born. So it was a big um, gathering. Mm -hmm. You were in the Chicago downtown area? I was on the south side of Chicago. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And what was wonderful about living in Chicago was that so many different cultural events to go to. Mm-hmm. And one of my pleasant memories is that my mother used to take us by bus with my aunt by car to any free cultural event like the Museum of Science and Industry. Uh, we would go to the lakefront for the, the zoos. Anything that was new and different, mm-hmm. we should find a way to get us there. Oh, that's sweet. It helped me to appreciate the diversity mm-hmm. and um, that any place you go is unlimited opportunities mm-hmm. to explore. Mm-hmm. And how long were you in the south side of Chicago? I left home in 19. Okay. 
And there was always the core of our family was situated there. Mm -hmm. So South Side Chicago encompasses Chicago's like a grid okay. from zero to a hundred going south or zero to a hundred going north. Okay. East and west. And so I lived in the nineties south, which is close to the Indiana border. I see. And zero is downtown. Okay, so zero is right in the center. It's in the center. So I was far south. Yeah. So this was right after high school that you left the South Yes. Side um, I went away to college. Okay. And I basically came back for like two, three years and haven't been back since except to visit. Okay. So tell me about college. Where'd uh, you go? I went to two um, colleges. The first one was Illinois Wesleyan mm -hmm. University in Southern Illinois. And then I eloped and went out. <laughs> <laughs> and then I went out to uh, Colorado and finished school at Metropolitan State University, which was an urban school mm. set right in the city of Denver. Okay. And we also shared classes with the um, University of Colorado. Mm. And what did you study? Sociology and psychology. Mm -hmm. So how long were you in Denver? Let's see, about three years. Okay. And um, I came back to Chicago briefly. Mm-hmm. From there, I came to Connecticut on a, a um, job transfer. Okay, so who who were you working for? Travelers. Okay, so, so when you went when you left Denver and went to the, back to Chicago, that's where you got the job at Travelers. Interestingly, yes. Okay, <laughs> I, I wasn't planning on it, yeah. but it fell in my lap, and I was to be stationed in um, Denver. I study um, sociology and psychology. Okay. So in Denver, I worked at a mental health clinic, mm. and we did outreach. And when I was hired by travelers in Denver, I, I didn't even know, I didn't even want the job, because <laughs> the only insurance I knew of at the time was Allstate mm -hmm. and State Farm, mm -hmm. and they sent me for interview, and it was in a real tiny little side building, and it had an umbrella. And I thought it was one of those fly-by-night organizations. So I didn't do a conventional interview with them, and they hired me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> when you say you didn't do a conventional interview, what, what, do you, what, what do you mean? I didn't give straight answers. You that were just not really serious? I wasn't serious, but I was truthful, but not oh, okay. the answers that they wouldn't expect. Right. And I was shocked that they called me back. Mm -hmm. And I was very suspicious under those circumstances. What do you mean by suspicious? Why, why would they want to hire me? You know, okay. that wasn't my background. So I asked for double the salary since I figured. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so were, you knew you, that they really needed you. Yeah, um, yes, they were trying to um, have diversity. I see. And I, see. I figured I filled two slots, being okay. a woman, and I was African-American. Right. So my logic was supposed to get double the pay. But of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, so being bold and, and being naive at the same time, mm. I got hired. Mm. And then I went back to Chicago. And once I got hired in Chicago, it became my career. Mm. And through a job transfer, it brought me to Connecticut. Now, tell me about the job transfer. They were trying to find young people to bring into their corporate office here. Hartford was the insurance capital of the world at the time. Mm. And coming to Hartford would give me more exposure and opportunity to move up in management. Mm -hmm. And I took the opportunity and once I came here, it was like coming to another country. I'd oh. never been out east. Yeah. I had a Midwestern twang, a slight one. And hear words like tonic water. That was my coworker who was from Boston. And then hear about sneakers, where we call them tennis shoes, um, tonic water, soda, we called it pop, different little mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And stores, everything closing down early was different, and it was very picturesque. You had heels, you had water. It's pretty flat where you were. Very flat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm spoiled by the New England yeah. um, countryside and, and landscapes. So you moved to the Hartford metropolitan area. Yes, I did. And I moved, and that was a corporate um, setting that mm -hmm. was there, mm -hmm. and I came in the middle of winter. Oh, dear. 
you had pretty severe winters in Chicago, right? And, um, I came in that one year where where your convention center roof oh fell in. Yeah, so I didn't think uh, that ours was as severe after experiencing <laughs> that winter. <laughs> <laughs> now the one thing was I had to get used to the layout of travelers because okay. it was so large. Uh-huh. But ironically, I got lost going with my work unit, going to the cafeteria, and that's how I met my husband. Uh-huh. So within two weeks of being in Connecticut, I met my future husband. Uh-huh. Now, you couldn't lost. have told me that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. years ago. Yeah. So. Yeah. Because he had to convince me why I need to stay here because I thought New England was ugly, it was cold, <laughs> and I was so homesick at that uh, time. So you really were thinking about coming, going back? I would seriously think about going yeah, back, yeah. but he had to convince me, you know, that there were a lot of things here that would make it worth my while to stay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so you stayed. Well, I have. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. uh, thir- you know, yeah. more than 30 years later. Now, how long were you in the Hartford metropolitan area? Working there, I, I was there about close to two years. Mm-hmm. Within the last... 10 years, I've been commuting from Norwich, Connecticut to Hartford on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. So I actually came full circle. And believe it or not, I'm working now in, um, in mental health again. <laughs> so are you still at Travelers? No, I'm, I'm at the Department of um, Children and Families. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I work in their central office. Mm-hmm. So you left Hartford after three years, and you moved... Two, two years. Two years, and I came down to New London area. Okay. All right. You started a, started a new family down in New London. Yes, I did. Okay. I used to call home and tell my mother, guess what? <laughs> she said, and after three times, she said, you must stop drinking that water <laughs> down there. <laughs> so I had an only child for five years, and I had three in a row. So oh, I ended okay. up with a family of four. Mm-hmm. And you were still commuting to Hartford from New London? No, when I came to New London, yeah. my husband worked for Kodak. He okay. commuted, and he uh-huh. grew up in New London. I see. So we moved into his um, family house. Mm-hmm. I was then a stay-at-home mom. Okay. And that was yeah. a new experience for me because I always mm-hmm. thought of myself as being a career person. Yeah. So what was that like? Very different because I had to learn to cook from scratch. Okay. <laughs> and learn to meet people I, I found out you can have free aerobics by running up and down the stairs while going to the gym that was the slimmest I ever been I was able to walk through the whole city you know pushing strollers and later chasing children mm-hmm. but I learned the area pretty well mm-hmm. and in New London were you also involved with the um, multicultural coalition in southeast Connecticut yes I was being at home, I um, wanted to get out more, and I joined many organizations, and each one led into another, mm-hmm. and one was the Women's Center, where I volunteered, and I met people. So mm-hmm. you had a sort of a set of friends in the area that you were- People I had met in doing community work. Okay. All this conference called The World of Difference, mm-hmm. it became- so energizing that uh, we decided to form a um, coalition and that became the multicultural coalition I see, I see. and uh, one of the uh, projects that we did it started out on a conversation on racism uh, we formed a, a multicultural coalition and we sponsored the institute for the healing of racism now what's that best way to describe it is that a lot of people can talk And they want to break down the barriers of differences and um, their prejudices. But we learned through a process is that we learn to relate to each other heart to heart. We go beyond words. An example is sitting with a person, looking at them eye to eye and almost knee to knee. You hear what they're saying, really hear and it's not necessarily the words, but what's from their heart. And that breaks down a lot of barriers. Mm-hmm. You get a lot of understanding that way. Mm-hmm. You learn to understand that there's only one race, and that's the human race. Mm-hmm. And I used to joke with my kids that uh, your mother didn't have a crocodile, you know? <laughs> what and, does that mean? and by saying that 
rather than be boxed and saying, are you white, black, you know, Hispanic or, or whatever, we're only one human species. Mm. We're not a crocodile. We're not an alligator. Mm. We're human. But ethnically, we may identify as something, Mm -hmm. or culturally, we may identify. Mm. But our race, our species, is human. Mm. And truly, we're spiritual beings actually having a human experience. Mm -hmm. And um, so we also relate spirit to spirit. Mm. And spirit is like the joy or whatever you feel in the presence of someone else, Mm. whether it's something pleasurable or something that repels you as your inner self Mm -hmm. and it opened up a lot of doors and it brought me into contact with so many wonderful people that had I been limited or thought in a in a very homogeneous way I would never have that opportunity to experience Mm -hmm. and I really was able to engage my children in that process as well Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And all of that, my kids became diverse. They start traveling mm-hmm. to different countries in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, we bring different people into our homes. Mm-hmm. We go all out of our way whenever possible mm-hmm. to um, to engage people who normally would have been considered on the outside mm-hmm. without fear. It's just like we they were truly a family member. Mm-hmm. It's just open up. A whole new world and, and enriched our lives. Mm-hmm. Now, at what point did you become a Baha'i? I became a Baha'i. I first heard about it in college. Okay. And um, this was when I was in Illinois Wesleyan. Okay. And it was um, during the time, guess who was coming for dinner was out? This was during the time of the Chicago race riots mm. and Martin Luther King had died. And i never forget this experience in where my cousin uh, was dating a young girl who was Cuban had a white roommate and we went to a restaurant and this is in southern Illinois and we wouldn't get waited on when he acquired by the waitress she brought in a manager who became infuriated and started beating up on him and I was terror I mean I was shocked by that and traumatized and I went to campus and all people who didn't go away for that weekend came down so they thought we were having a riot Mm -hmm. so it was a huge public event that caused investigation and all of that they hired diverse staff more students got to know each other because that was predominantly white college it was more of a bond and I met some people who invited me to what was called a fireside Mm. now a fireside is where you talk about a religious topic and just discuss it Mm -hmm. and you go to the writings the holy writings of what of the religion. For example, in the Baha'i, you would go to the holy um, writings of the um, prophet founder. Um, you may even have a reference to the Holy Bible because mm-hmm. it's Christian or the Quran because it's uh, Muslim. But these were college students and it was such a uh, spirit of uh, integration and diversity and love in that room. Mm-hmm. And truly, I'd never been in a white home before. Oh, wow. And... I don't remember exactly what was said, but it was the spirit mm. that I was feeling in that room. And I didn't forget it, so I brought my roommate the next week, and she was white. And she declared, and I told her, oh, you're not supposed to do that. Now, what does that mean? Declared means that she decided to become a Baha'i on the spot. Okay. And I said, oh, we're just supposed to read the pamphlets. So then she brought a friend of ours the following week, and she became a Baha'i, too. Mm. So that kind of scared me. So I didn't become a Baha'i till three years later. Oh, really? Exactly. Yeah. So what was holding you back? I never read anything. I just was in that room with that spirit. But somehow, in my last year semester in school, I saw this picture and it was up, later found out it was of the uh, Baha'i Temple in Chicago. And having grown up in Chicago, I never saw it. I mean, and I couldn't believe they told me it was in Chicago. And in the way my mother exposed us to as many different things as she did, I thought we'd have seen it. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, no, that couldn't be in Chicago. I grew up in Chicago. And I found out it was. And so they invited me to a fireside. So once again... I had that same experience of all the people who were diverse, the love that was in the room. 
And this time I listened a little bit more, but not enough. And I came the second time and just became a Baha'i and found out they believed in the oneness of mankind, that um, there's equality between the men and women, that also you investigate the truth for yourself. And it, ha it gave so many wonderful tenets, such as um, solving the economic problem spiritually, to get rid of the extreme of the excessively wealthy and, and the, um, being poor, and uh, mass education for everybody. It was so much that I felt that would help society, and the writings were incredible. Mm. It's just like, noble have I created thee. Why dost thou abase thyself? Rise then to what thou was created. And to me, it was more or less like you weren't like born in sin, die in sin, so what's the use of trying? It already said you were a noble person, mm. and it brought out positiveness. And so years later, with the uh, Multicultural Coalition, and they're talking about a way of trying to heal the racism, and they were talking about heart-to-heart -heart and spirit-to-spirit. -spirit. I could rely on that experience to relate to what they were speaking of. Mm. And also, once again, be in a room of totally diverse people. And I'm saying diverse of um, social class, um, gender, culture, races, and intergenerational too. Mm -hmm. And to have that, you felt the oneness mm -hmm. of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, what was your religious upbringing like? I was baptized a Methodist, but I became a Lutheran. And um, At what age? Well, was, it, was it you or your family? Or no, it's me. My mother was open-minded. She said yeah. church was in your heart. So what drew, what drew you to the Lutheran faith? Um, in my neighborhood, okay. and it was all black community. Yeah. We had every kind of church. So we had and this, we had the Lutherans, we had the Catholics, we had the Methodists and the Baptists. Mm -hmm. And I would go to um, the Methodist church for Easter because they had better Easter eggs. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then the um, then you have the Catholic school, and then that's where the girls were. They went to you know. They were very prim and proper in my neighborhood. And then the Lutheran, I liked the minister because he was so down to earth. And my mother gave us totally free choice. And I'm the one who brought in my younger brothers and sisters. And how old were you at that time? I was 10. Did, were you going to church before then? No, I just wanted to go. You just so wanted to go to church? I just wanted to go. Interesting. And my mother never held us back. Sure. And I went to the church and I always wanted my whole family to sit in a pew because others' families. But my mother was self-conscious because she gave her all to us, her children, but she didn't feel she had the clothing uh -huh. to go. And she was the person that would live the life mm. rather than just to go to something one time. Mm -hmm. And I was always, I guess I was told I was civic-minded <laughs> and always wanted to do community service. Even at church, we, we would coordinate with the Catholic Church to share the palms for Palm Sunday. Oh, sweet. And how long were you involved with the Lutheran Church? I was a Lutheran until I, I was in college. And actually, um, I wrote a long letter to my minister because I loved him so dearly. But I came home to tell him I was a Baha'i. Mm. And I told him that it was because of him that I felt that I loved Jesus more after I became a Baha'i, and I never felt that I gave up Jesus mm -hmm. and loving him. Mm -hmm. I thanked him for him because I used to ask him tons and tons of questions when I was in my confirmation class, and most of them were answered in the Baha'i faith. Like what kind of questions? Well, I loved history, mm -hmm. and I was learning that there were Incas and Indians and um, Eskimos. And so I'm thinking in time of Christ, there were civilizations in other parts of the world and how come they didn't get to here? And even though they were born there, what did he do? Go to sleep at night and then come off in the cloud to another part of the world to tell them? And I couldn't get a, a straight answer. And my other question was, a person couldn't help when they were born into the world. They had no control. So what if you were born 10,000 years before Christ? Did you go to hell? And what if you were born another part of the world in time of Christ? Were you going to go to hell or today? 
as a Baha'i, I learned what was called progressive revelation. And what's that? And that means that God made a promise to us that he would never leave us alone. And that any time you were born in the world, he always made it possible for you to know him, to love him, and to worship him. So we know of people such as Abraham, Moses, Krishna, Buddha, Jesus Christ, and then you have Muhammad, and then the Baha'i faith. You had two prophets and born at the same time and playing each a unique role, and that was the Bob, which is a title meaning um, the gate, and Baha'u'llah means the glory of God. And so you had that opportunity to know him and to love him. Mm. And also it helped to explain the purpose of my life as I came to understand it, the purpose of my life was that I'm housed in a physical body, but my spirit and soul is eternal. But the condition depends on how I live here. Mm. And I have God-like qualities innate inside of me. But through tests or different challenges in life, I bring out these virtues and it's not about what I acquired materially in life, but about the relationships I had and the quality and the purity of what I do that helps me to reach to reunite with God. Mm. Also, it wasn't the fire and brimstone uh, sermons. I used to go to the storefront churches with some of my girlfriends and have grape juice and, and crackers and giggle. You know, <laughs> Our concept of heaven and hell was different. And that is heaven being close to God. And you could have it while at any given moment, but you also could have eternally. And hell was being away from God. It's being the separation and being totally on your own to act out your lower nature, mm-hmm. which you could have at any moment or be in that state eternally. Mm-hmm. Lost opportunities. Mm-hmm. After your involvement with the Institutes for the Healing of Racism. Okay. What did you get yourself involved with after that? Okay. Um, of the Institute of he- Healing Racism, we had wonderful and diverse people there. We had the Affirmative Action Director from uh, Connecticut College, Judy Kermsey. We also had a minister from a Lutheran church and a Catholic church. We had ministers. We had teachers. We had everyday people. We had parents. We had youth. We threw great conferences. New London had the very first international conference on Institute for the Healing and Racism. Mm. And it was so good. We even had people come all the way from Finland to attend. And the Coast Guard Academy and uh, Connecticut College and Lawrence Memorial Hospital. They were all great sponsors and participants. And we had Jane Early, who did blue-eyed, brown-eyed experiments. Oh, yes, yes. She was a featured a speaker and did workshops. And we also had Dr. Joy Leary DeGru, who at the time was working on her um, doctorate on the um, post-traumatic slave syndrome. So we had diverse religious uh, faiths that were also represented there, and um, people from everywhere. It was so energized and we had such good will and community service to take back into our community. Mm. Also, the second one, we didn't get a chance to sponsor because the people from uh, Michigan grabbed it. Grand Rapids, Michigan. Mm-hmm. And they got Kellogg's to sponsor theirs. Mm. And it's been held there ever since. Oh, really? But it's an awesome um, mm. experience and it really started in Texas, I found out. Mm. What were you involved with after? after that? Yeah. After that, I became more active in doing socioeconomic development with the Baha'i faith. And also, I had a long commute to Hartford. So you, you were back to work at this point? I, I, I was working continuously. But before, I worked locally in an office. Mm-hmm. But then I um, was transferred to um, another part of the state. Now, you were a stay-at-home mom for a while, right? Oh, okay. Let me get back to that. I was a stay-at-home mom for five years. I see. Okay. And uh, my youngest was four when I went to 
uh, work full time mm -hmm. for the state. But while I was a stay at home mom, I had part time positions mm -hmm. that I was working. Um, and one was a community action agency. Um, the other one was a job development for those who were getting out of prison or had substance abuse. Mm -hmm. But it was mostly in social services. Mm -hmm. Then raising my children and also I got very active with the Head Start program. I see. And I was on the policy council for that as well and mm -hmm. the Girl Scouts. Mm -hmm. We had a Girl Scout troop that was sponsored by Connecticut College students on their grounds in their Unity House, but we used the girls from the um, housing development who were poor mm. and then gave them lots of camp opportunities. Uh -huh. We raised $1,000 in cookie sales. Oh, wow. That's we, sweet. we went camping quite a bit that year. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's and cool. um, the other activities, like now I'm involved in trying to uh, start children's classes in the neighborhood. Mm. What um, kind of children's classes? Uh, we're working with virtues. Mm -hmm. And I tried to learn the curriculum that the Baha'i faith has used na nationally. Mm -hmm. And this is using different tools of learning for all different abilities. And I went to the National Center of Education and Lou uh, near Flint, Michigan, Lou Helen, to take the, that course. Mm -hmm. And I met pediatricians, um, science teachers, um, an elderly lady, you know, who had a stroke, those who came from, lived overseas, and we all had our pilot project and had to come back twice a year to report on it and to learn uh, other methods. And it was very exciting because I got to use it the day after I attended, right mm. here in my neighborhood. You I, initiated children's classes in the neighborhood. How many kids did you have? My neighborhood is growing in the diversity every day. As a matter of fact, last week we had a newborn in our neighborhood. So we have a Mexican, we have Haitian, we have African American, we have Puerto Rican, and we have East Indian, and now we have another neighbor at the far end who's Asian. Mm -hmm. And um, this is a area that's now being developed. It, these are very old, old houses from the 1700s, and they were multifamily that they're being renovated. And a lot of the families work one and a half jobs, and there's no after school program. So they're preschool all the way up to junior high, and some will be going to high school. And we play games. Um, the big thing I'm trying to do is, since I'm a grandmother, is and they don't have grandmothers because of where they move from or just in their life they don't, is to read. It's reading and doing arts and crafts. Sometimes transportation is a problem, but periodically if there are kids around and I'm going somewhere, I would take them with me. And uh, we went on a train ride, we went on a boat ride, we went to the library, had a storyteller, we had a birthday party of 17 kids in this living room. Can mm. you imagine that? Mm -hmm. We pushed back the furniture. We did the uh, limbo stick and hokey pokey and games and prizes. We had cookouts. We also watched the fireworks. I would like to get a safety program, you know, nearby with the police department and the fire department and the health department so the kids can know how to keep safe because I'm concerned that the parents don't have enough resources and our city is changing and, and, and doesn't have the same resources that my kids were able to benefit from. And to get the cohesiveness here is starting to happen. Mm. I grew up in a very close knit family but are also close knit neighborhood and I think because of the times and situation we could develop that again mm. kids are our future Yeah. and what is your occupation at the moment uh, right now I'm a children's services consultant and I work for youth who, who are transitioned out of um, a residential or group homes who have serious mental health problems or behavior problems and transition once they turn 18 until they 
are able to get into the adult system at 21 to find something to fill that gap. Mm. And mm. I work with that statewide. Mm. So that makes me feel even more urgent to work at, with kids and develop community and community resources and a sense of family within the community uh, for the children so that we will have less of the situation. Mm. We had a youth who were adolescents who've been through our system, foster care, multiple placements, um, group homes, and what have you. And we developed a youth advocacy group and leadership group, and it's a youth advisory board. And they went to the state capitol, and they were able to talk to the legislators and also to represent them. And at the time was Nancy Johnson, not for those who are not within the state of Connecticut. Oh, okay. It was it was a state legislator. She's, actually, she's so, a former she, House of Representatives delegate for Connecticut. Yes, she was. Yeah. And what she did was uh, she invited some of our youth, and they went to um, to the Capitol, and and they testified, and they came back basically. Now each of our children, um, youth who decide after eighteen to volunteer to remain in the custody of DCF. Our, our, our child protection agency, mm -hmm. they get a computer. And uh, we're able to help finance them continue in school, post high school, in a vocational school or college up until they're 23. And also we help find them apartments and part-time jobs and um, give them life skills so they know how to budget. So theoretically, upon graduating from um, school, college, or vocation. Uh, vocational school, they have their own apartment, they have some savings, and they could be viable uh, citizens. Mm. And then also, this is a true story that happened. I had to substitute for someone this day for a youth advisory board meeting and take them to dinner, our youth to dinner, and also for them to have their meeting. Well, I remember an exhibit at the uh, state capitol, which isn't far from where I work, we took the youth over there, and it was about astronauts. And it was down the gallery. And they had this round rotunda where you seat people. And we had teenage parents, and one brought her baby, and she set the infant seat on the um, round rotunda. And it was getting close to closing, and she had the blanket over it. So the legislators came out, and they thought it was a banded baby. And they're all crowded around it. And you could see the puzzle look and the relief when we came back out of the gallery. And so we used the opportunity because they were able to advocate for themselves. They introduced themselves, had the legislators introduce them. You know, they already went on tour on how to make a bill. <laughs> It was very empowering for them mm -hmm. and also um, helped the legislators to better appreciate our youth and to put a face behind it. Mm -hmm. And what would they do if it really was an abandoned baby? Yeah. What resources would they have had, especially at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. Another um, service that we have for our youth is it's a youth support group, and it's called YAO. And it's a youth advisory group for Families United. And these are parents whose children have a mental illness, such as anxiety disorder or bipolar, who form together to help their children to advocate for themselves so they learn to be independent in the future, to get services, and also to have a, a safe social experience as a group. And these youth are phenomenal. Mm. Mm -hmm. And they were able to get a grant for one year. They use social occasions to learn social skills, but also to educate each other and others as well. Mm -hmm. So right now they're putting together a holiday basket. They're collecting um, canned goods for others. They're very adept lately at fundraising. And they, they really want to give back to others in the community. And they were so excited at the last meeting, and the meeting is made up, and the board is made up predominantly youth, that they want to do community service year-round. Mm -hmm. They um, interviewed and hired a youth coordinator, and those questions were better than anything we could have came up with. Interview questions. 
interview questions and they said we want you to attend our next meeting so we can see how you will interact and how you truly facilitate very very good they mm -hmm. are good we put up a website and they did a video of their experiences and they did it totally by themselves mm -hmm. and they were able to present at a um of a national conference youth conference mm -hmm. with their video very that they nice. um put together very nice yeah. So it's a lot of rewarding things That's happening. That's great. So what does the future hold for you, Darlene? A lot of excitement. Um, this year, for the first time in my life, I went overseas and I went totally by myself. And I survived it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Israel and I climbed a mountain. And then I also went to Brussels and fell down an escalator. But I was... <laughs> <laughs> so I could climb a mountain but fall, fall down an escalator but not hit bottom. But I was so resilient that I went to Paris the following day and mm. went to the Eiffel Tower and mm. the Louvre. And I'm intoxicated by it. I'm taking my granddaughter. I'm going to Europe. And when I retire, hopefully, I can find a third world country that appreciates an older eccentric woman and work in maternal infant health Very field. Nice. Very nice. I'm just excited that life has so much possibilities. Excellent, excellent. Well, Darlene, thank you so much. It's been a joy, and thank you so very much. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Darlene Key, a Baha'i and a social worker from the state of Connecticut. For a copy of this and other interviews, you're welcome to go to the website www.abahaiperspective.com. For information specifically on the Baha'i faith, you can go to the website www.baha'i.org where you can call the toll-free number 1-800-22-UNITE.